I'm very honored to be here. This is the third time we scheduled this. We had COVID cancellations twice before, and so I'm extremely happy to be here. Uh, after Dan's uh, eloquent introduction, I'm not sure if I even need to give the talk. You've heard, uh, every, uh, heard what I've done, but... Um, okay, so um, uh, let me just put it this way. Um, here's the problem. The problem is that humans shared a relative with other primates, specifically uh, chimpanzees and bonobos, about four to six million years ago. So what that means is that we are as similar from a time depth point of view and genetically, we are as similar to chimpanzees and bonobos as lions are to tigers, horses are to zebras, or rats are to mice. Okay, so those are different species, but uh, they're pretty similar socially, cognitively, right? So how is it that in that relatively short evolutionary time, I know that five million years seems like a lot, but you know, in evolution it goes by quickly. Um, how did we get so different in such a short amount of evolutionary time? And by so different, I mean the puzzle is that we have complex technologies, cities with buildings, we have languages, we have uh, simple systems like Arabic numerals, and we have institutions like universities and governments. The chimps, our very close evolutionary relatives, are still in the jungle, okay? They're not doing these things. How did we humans get to do it? And the answer that I've been pursuing for the last 20 years or so is that we're not doing it as individuals. We are not, we would not be uh, we are not individually that smart or that powerful compared to other primates. It's the fact that we have found ways to pool our cognitive resources and to work with one another, to socially learn from others, to cooperate with others, to communicate with others. My thought experiment uh, to uh, sort of bring this home is a child, what if a child were born on a desert island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and no social interaction with anyone for their whole life? No language, no education, no pictures, no books, nobody teach them anything, nothing. What would their cognition be like as an adult? And my contention is it would be not very different from those of other great apes. You have skills with mathematics because somebody taught you and somebody gave you Arabic numerals that helped you to do it. And, and uh, uh, the same with you learned a language because you heard other people speaking. You didn't invent language, you didn't invent mathematics. So we can think of a kind of a, <clears throat> what we've called the ratchet effect. And this is a very simple example. Just take, uh, let's say that we're using a uh, hammer for, a, using a rock for a hammer. And let's just say there are a bunch of people way back millions of years ago, a couple of million years ago, using rocks for hammers. And then one day some brilliant individual invents, says, oh, if you tie the rock to a stick, it makes it more powerful. And they made a hammer out of it. Okay, so notice that out of this whole group that knows how to use a rock, only one of them had the brilliancy to think of tying it onto a hammer, tying it onto a stick and making it a hammer. But they all get it. So the horizontal transmission, everybody learns it. One brilliant person invents it and then we all get it. And now at a next step, somebody else, and we're skipping a few million years here, <laughs> somebody else uh, comes up with another idea but notice this isn't the same individual. So the, everybody in the group is benefiting from a single genius. Some individual genius invented the numeral zero in the Arabic numeral system and everybody uses it immediately and it's all, uh, it transforms the way everybody thinks. So what humans are doing is they are leveraging the brilliance of individuals into the whole group. And then another person can be the brilliant person that does the next one. And then we end up with those uh, steam-driven pile drivers in the end. So this is what we call the ratchet effect. It's cumulative cultural evolution. It means that we have artifacts, including cultural practices, as well as material artifacts like tools and symbolic artifacts like language and Arabic numerals. And um, uh, uh, we, these things start out simple. And then over historical, cultural historical time, they ratchet up in complexity. So these artifacts have a history. Okay, the symbolic artifacts, the material artifacts, the cultural practices, they have a history. Chimpanzees and other great apes don't have things with histories. 
because they don't have this cumulative buildup of everything in the cultural group. So I started with this idea that what really makes humans different is our ability to put our heads together over time and to build up these things in complexity over time. But as time has gone on, I've decided that while my early answer to what makes humans different was basically in one word, culture, and these cultural processes like ratchet effect, but I now have come to believe that a better answer is cooperation. And you can view culture as a big cooperative activity. A cultural group is a group of people that work together and cooperate together. Between cultural groups may be a different story, and I'm expecting a question in the Q&A about uh, all the lack of cooperation in the world today, which there definitely is. We'll come, I'm, I have an answer for that. <laughs> not, no, not an answer in the terms of a, a solution, but an answer in terms of where it came from. Um, so now what I think is something more like this, that chimpanzees are, are, and other great apes they, their life is mainly ruled by competition. They cooperate a little bit here and there, but mainly they're competing for food, competing for mates, etc. Early humans at some point began to collaborate. So the word cooperation is used quite generally. I mean co-labor, work together, especially in uh, cooperative foraging, collaborative foraging. Um, to, and so what happened was these individuals had to work together to get their food or they would die. So they're doing things like hunting big game and you can't do it by yourself. You have to collaborate. Some of the gathering activities, you need two people to do the gathering, the tubers that a lot of hunter gatherers eat. You need one person to dig and one person to pull, right? So you have to be a good collaborator or you're gonna starve, okay? This is the evolutionary pressure. We are become interdependent. We depend on one another for our very livelihood in a way that chimpanzees do not. Chimpanzees do a little cooperation here and there, but they don't have to cooperate to eat, which at some point in human evolution, we did. Uh, then, that's, that's a step for those of you who really want to know about time frames, about a half a million years ago, maybe a million years ago. And then, more recently, 200,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, we started human cultures. And now, this collaboration has scaled up to the whole group. The whole group is one big collaborative activity where division of labor, where you do the gathering, I take care of the kids, somebody else does something else. So we have a big collaborative group. So this is the proposal in a couple of my uh, books on the, uh, how we got to be so cooperative uh, compared to other great apes. We went through the, these steps here. And uh, in on, now we can't observe those steps back there. They, they're, they're gone. Uh, human behavior and cognition doesn't fossilize, so we can't see it. But if this was the process in evolution, we should be able to see it in children today as they develop. We should be able to see there's not a, it's not the case that human development recapitulates the steps of human evolution. Uh, but we should be able to see the simpler forms in younger children. We should be able to see this build up if these are really adaptations. And what brings them into relief is the comparative experiments comparing them to other great apes, especially chimpanzees. So we want to see if children are doing something unique compared to them, and we want to see how it builds up in the children. That's the program. All right, I'm going to give you a feel of this. Uh, I actually have a couple of home movies here. <laughs> a feel of this, of um, three behaviors that occur begin occurring at around nine months of age that are unique to human beings. Uh, and you're going to see the chimpanzee comparison in just a second. So uh, on the left is collaboration. This is my daughter on her nine month birthday. So I thought, let's get out the camera and let's see if she can do this little collaborative thing just as she turned nine months. So the research shows, our research and other people's research shows that nine months is a key transition point. So um, watch uh, in the one, <clears throat> the leftmost here thing that says collaboration uh, about this little simple activity. <laughs> So I get very excited because it's her nine month birthday and I have written about the nine month revolution. But you can see she rolls the ball back. I'm like, oh my God, she rolled it back. But watch where she's looking. Watch her eyes. She rolls it, but then she looks up to see, oh, okay. And now back. And this is key. The looking is key because it says we're sharing this. We're doing it together. And she looks, okay. So um, a chimpanzee could conceivably 
slap a ball to you and you slap it back, but they're not looking up at you. What's your reaction? Isn't this fun? They're not sharing the activity in the same way. Here's something, the next one, showing, this is a communicative behavior, uh, and what is its goal? Tell me what the child's goal is here. This child is about 14 months. What's the goal? <laughs> he doesn't want the adult to work the toy, doesn't want anything else. Isn't this cool? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it, that's the response. In fact, we've done an experiment like that where uh, if the adult responds differently, if the adult looks at it and just goes, the kid goes, no, really, this is great, don't you think? <laughs> right? So they really, and that's what they want from you. That's what you. And that's what you would naturally do if you were playing with a 14 month old and they held it up, you'd say, oh, cool, great. Right? That's what they want, they wanna share experience with you. And here's the uh, classic, this is the classic book reading. And this is my daughter again on the nine month birthday. You can tell she has on the same shirt. Uh, and she looks back at mom. Uh, sorry, let me do that again. Sorry. Uh, watch her look back. Watch her look back in the joint. She, she's looking back at mom because we're doing it together. And she, and she does her little finger on there. And she says something. So we are excited. We think it's baby. <laughs> okay. The sibling is on the, is on the camera and she looks at the sibling because the sibling is excited. She said baby. All right. So we're you know, typical middle-class parents. What can I say? Um, okay. This is a triadic engagement. You and me are sharing experience to this, to this ball rolling game, to this block, to this book. And now you're gonna see what chimpanzees do in a similar situation. This is a human raised chimpanzee. Her mother didn't take care of her. Her name is Annette. She's about two years old, two and a half here uh, with her human caretaker. And I, you can see where I spliced together several things, but I spliced together several things in this same general activity to try to get something that looked like uh, what the child's were doing there. So you're gonna see something with the ball. Okay, so she grabs the ball and gives it to her. She says, look, okay, let's play with the ball. All right, and now Annette's attention gets on the ball. All right, but now she just wants to play with it on her own. And she's gonna just play on her own. And now there's no triadic engagement about the ball or not playing a game back and forth. <laughs> All right, now I splice together, we're gonna to go with the book. So the caretaker's gonna read her the book. Annette is interested in the book for sure, right? But no turning around and looking, no pointing for the other one, nothing triadic, no, no triangle. Okay. All right, and now she's gonna get the book herself in just a minute. All right. All right, I think I have another splice coming up here, right? And now she has the book herself and she actually touches the pages with her finger in something, uh, it's not a pointing gesture, but she's sort of, you know, looking like this and she's interested, but she doesn't say, look at this, isn't it cool? She doesn't show it to mom. She's not sharing experience, she's not interested in it. And now she's back to her ball. Okay. So what I, what I want you to get out of that comparison between the kid and this is that the kid, the whole thing is sharing the experience with their parents, okay? And the chimp is having fun with the toys, but there's nothing going on there about sharing. So this is what um, Dan mentioned about shared intentionality. This is the shared intentionality schema, as I've called it. Um, we're doing something together. We have a joint goal. We're trying to read the book together. We're playing this game of ball together. We have a joint goal. We have joint attention to things relevant to our joint goal. So, oh, the ball fell off here, let's get it back, blah, blah, blah. But within the shared goal and the shared attention, the joint goal and the joint attention, I have my role to play and you have your role to play. I hold the book and you touch it or you name it or whatever. And I have my perspective, I'm seeing it from this side and you're seeing it from that side. So this kind of dual level, this is literally, this is for me, the schematic depiction of the cognitive difference between humans and great apes, is that we have this simultaneous sharing, but individuality. 
Shared goal, different roles. Shared attention, different perspectives. Okay? And this is important because you can't have a role without some kind of shared goal. You're, when you say there's a role in something, the role is in something larger that you're playing. And you can't have a perspective on something unless you're sharing it. We both know that you see this from this direction, I see it from this direction. Right? But we have to share it. If you look out that window and I look out that window, we just see different things. Perspective is different perspectives on the same thing. And roles are different roles within the same activity. Right? So that's what they don't have. They don't have this sharedness and individuality all mixed together. Okay, so what I want to do now is uh, step you through uh, several different topic areas and just um, illustrate some experiments. And all I'm going to do is show you videos. I'm not going to go into the methodology of the experiences, anything, experiments or anything like that. Um, I'm actually really happy to be in a series with all the humanists and whatnot. So I don't want to get bogged down in experimental details. I want to give you the general idea here. So we go through several domains. So here's communication. You already saw the showing, so you know sort of what's coming, but I want to show you a little bit more. So we actually studied chimpanzee uh, communication, gestural communication for quite a while early on, back in the 1980s and early 90s. And they do something that other um, primates don't do. Uh, great apes do things that, that other monkeys don't do. They really have a very deliberate form of communication. We call it intentional communication. So this little kid wants to go for a walk, and he want, but he doesn't want to go alone because he needs mom to come with him. And so you're going to see him uh, tug at mom, but what he's going to do is a kind of a ritualized pulling. He's not trying to physically pull her. He's trying to say, Tink, come on. But it's very deliberate, right? I mean, that just looks so intentional. All right, and they're going on their little walk together. But again, this is dyadic. This is about you and me. All the chimpanzee, the really great um, gestural communication that we've documented in them is all about grooming, uh, fighting, mating, uh, playing. They're all face-to-face -face things. It's not you and me about some third outside thing. It's just that regulating our dyadic interaction. And here's what you get with kids. It's a little collaborative thing. This is a 14-month-old. And this is a, there's something inside the tube. And uh, the experimenter is, is going to be difficult on purpose. And then look, there. Okay. Okay. So this, to me, is actually indicative of... Uh, when I see this, and I'm thinking in my, I have my evolutionary hat on, I'm thinking, this, this, looks, this is early humans right here, okay? They're doing something together. They're, they're collaborating for foraging or something, and you dropped your spear or something happened, and I say, okay? So these are pre-linguistic children, but they're already thinking like a we. They're already thinking, we are doing this together. Oh, you're having problems here. I'll help you by communicating, by telling you where something is. So, so this, this uniquely human form of communication, I believe rests on, uh, Dan used the word infrastructure, I've used that word, on, a, on an infrastructure of shared intentionality. We're doing it together, you have your role, I have my role, you have your perspective, I have my perspective. All right? And that's where this communication comes in. I'm helping you to do this thing because we are working together and I need us both to be doing a good job for us to be successful. Um, Here's um, a, um, a little girl, just, this is very classic. Uh, again, this is child's 14 months old, I think. Um, this is your classic so-called declarative pointing. She just points. Dad, she doesn't want dad to get her something. She doesn't want it. It's just, look, isn't that interesting? And you say, oh, isn't that cute? That's what 10-month-olds do. But we adults, especially for scientists, we talk about real important things. Well, I will tell you that if you look at people that, you know, in the general uh, general public, uh, uh, much of what we do every day is analogous to this, and the analogy is gossip. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Did you hear who's dating who? Did you hear who won the game last night? Did you hear the scandal down at City Hall? All right? We talk about things where the only reaction we want from people, we're not informed, is, oh, wow, that's interesting. Well, tell me more. All right? So this is, again, the roots of the motivation of sharing. And here I just show you again this, because this one is really absolutely clear that the only motivation is, um, is to share. Okay, so human communication is different in these, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm purposely choosing examples other than language, because language, of course, makes this difference. To use the metaphor that um, 
that Dan mentioned about the capstone, uh, to, to me, uh, language is uh, the icing on the cake or the capstone on, on this other form of communication that's already uniquely human. So um, it's different both in its motivation, because the motivation is to share attention. And I mean, all the posting in Facebook and Twitter and all that, why are people doing all that? They want to share it. It's, when you find something cool happens, you want to share it. That's just, it's a natural human motivation. And, and the chimps don't have that motivation and they don't have the focus on the external thing. So it's different in both motivation and structure. Already pre-linguistically in children. Okay, collaboration. So just working together, again, you saw one little thing, but let me show you this. Uh, this is an 18 month old and playing a silly little game that Felix Varnikin made up. <laughs> And just watch the way they play it. His, he is being difficult on purpose, like he was on the other one. He's being difficult on purpose. That's the whole experiment, is that. And this little kid is a little bit frustrated. And now Felix is going to just play around a little bit. And, and, and he puts it in his hand, right? And, and, oh, there we go. All right. And now watch, he's going to be a little bit difficult again. He's playing around at being difficult to see what the kid does to repair. Okay. So... Okay. So that's what I call motivated, okay? Right. Uh, I will say that we have some other tasks with young children where they don't have to have the partner. In that one, you can't play the game without a partner. But we also have one where uh, we both are making a clown jump up and down, you with your thing and me with my thing. And if the other guy goes out, they don't want to play by themselves. They want you to do it too, even though they can make the clown bounce up and down by themselves. So the game is a little bit of fun, but the real fun is doing it with you and doing it together, as we all, as we all know. Um, okay, here's, a two, here's Annette again. Watch it, watch her. She's capable of doing everything. She's capable of shaking the thing. She's capable of all of it. All right, let's go, Annette. Ready? Let's do it. She's seen it work before. She's seen other people do it. No. All right. She's not interested. Just collaborating with somebody for the fun of it is not interesting. And I would say if you surveyed all the several billion species on the planet Earth, you would find that all of them think this is a stupid game, <laughs> except for that one. Okay. <laughs> That's the only one that doesn't, right? And so that's what needs explaining. Why does this kid find that so much fun and work so hard to collaborate uh, when the chimp just has no interest whatsoever? So that's a motivational thing. Now, part of the explanation is, if you look at any of these uh, computational um, models for the evolution of cooperation, is the evolution of cooperation has to happen that we, we both benefit, right? And uh, um, we can't let people who didn't collaborate get as many rewards as us. That's the free rider problem. But let me focus on both benefiting. So this is a little task. And you see here, um, the rope is strung through some uh, little hooks here. So if you pull the rope, it just comes out. So you have to wait for the other guy to pull. Chimpanzees learn this very quickly. Maybe, you know, maybe an hour of training, maybe less. Uh, they learned that you have to wait for the other guy to pull. This is a film from a TV thing, and it actually combines two experiments in one. So this is not exactly the way things work. But uh, you're going to see how clearly the first chimp understands that she needs a partner. She not only waits, but she goes and fetches her partner. But then you're going to see what the problem is with chimp cooperation, collaboration. So what will the chimpanzee do? So he realizes he can't do she it. She goes and own. opens the door for her partner. I was absolutely nonplussed. They pull the rope together. 
So you're saying, I thought they didn't collaborate very well. What are you talking about? Well, they're doing this, this but the, chimpanzees help the food other. is separated. Each has food in their own cut. Now we're putting the food in the middle. Well, the two chimps still help each now, other. Now, the problem of dividing the spoils is not solved for them. They have to solve it. And you will see what they do. Both hold the rope. Not enthusiastic. Why? Because she knows what's going to happen. But the dominant chimpanzee grabs all the food. Guess what happens on the next trial? The subordinate quits cooperating. There's nothing in it for me. What, what's, what kind of cooperation is that? Where you, we do all the, we work together and you get all the rewards? No, sorry. Right. So um, I think this is one of the, one of the really um, key choke points. <laughs> People always ask me, why didn't chimpanzees, if, if being cooperative is so useful, why didn't chimps develop it? Well, the concrete answer is they can't figure out how to divide the spoils fairly or in a mutually satisfactory way. That's the, that's the concrete answer. Chimps are built, uh, and you can watch this. You have a very nice group of chimps here in, in the, in the uh, Copenhagen Zoo. Um, and you can watch them at feeding. When they feed them, when they feed them at night, they will take the large pile and they will put it over here for the dominant. And once the dominant gets started, then they distribute it to the others because they are, uh, they are built to contest food uh, by dominance. That's what dominance is doing. Right? And, uh, and, and when they get in something like this, they can't turn it off. Now, here are some human children. Um, I actually chose this video where one of the kids is gonna act a little bit like, these are little German kids, three years old. Um, and they're only getting it in the middle. So they're just, they're just getting it in the middle. These are four gummy bearshin. And this little boy in the red is gonna go over like the dominant chimp, but he actually only, he doesn't, he doesn't take one. He actually doesn't take any. It's hard to see, but there's still four there. The other kid comments, they're not on my side. Oh, they're in the middle. Comes over, starts to take three. The other kids, no. <laughs> He takes two, and he takes two. Scafina. And they can do this all day long, as long as, as, for as many gummy bears as their parents will let them have, okay? <clears throat> so they can keep collaborating over time. It's a stable strategy is the evolutionary term for it, uh, because they have a way of working out the dividing of the spoils that's satisfactory to both of them. It's a fair division of spoils, right? Um, if they, uh, do I have another one here? No, sorry, I don't have the other one. Um, uh, there's, I have another one where a, little, where, where a little girl takes three and, the other, and leaves only one for the other, and she comes and says, hey, what are you doing? And the little girl hands over the other one. So even if one of them starts to be greedy, the other one protests, and she hands it back. So they have mechanisms for, they almost always divide equally. Notice that it's only four, so they, they can tell two and two is equal. All right, and, and that's sufficient for the three-year-olds. And, um, uh, um, and, and, and they can do this even when one of them is greedy, they have a way of working out to balance it out. And in all these experiments, either they divide it equally from the beginning or one of them protests and the other guy equalizes, it almost never ends up unequal. Um, now you may say, I have children at home. <laughs> I know some of you are thinking that, okay? I will say two things about that. Uh, one of them is, th the important difference is, nobody has this in their hand to start with. If they start with four gummy bears in their hands, and you say, share some with your friend, they don't share. Or they share one and keep three. They don't share equally. So there's something different when you've got it in your hands versus we think this collaboration really engenders this idea that we work together, therefore we benefit together in a roughly equal way. We're equal partners in the collaboration, we're equal partners in sharing the spoils. So we think that facilitates uh, that. And here's the experiment we did that really shows it, is um, uh, what we, well, you're gonna see how this works. They're pulling together, they're generating it together. These are marbles and they get, to, they get the marble and you're gonna see at the very end, they get to put it down a chute and it goes clean. And, and they think this is great fun. Um, again, we can't get chimps to work for cling. They have to have food. But uh, anyway, you'll see what happens here. They're going to work together and then watch what happens. We rigged it so that, whoops, 
three to one side and one to the other. So now he's got three in his hand. But he shares it out two to two. Almost every time. All right. We have a control condition. Experimenters always have to have control conditions. We have a control condition where they walk in the room and it's already one here and three here. No collaboration. It's just there. Guess what? The one with the three hardly ever shares. So he shared, I think it's some, it's a, these are the best data I ever got in my life. This, in, the, in the control condition, they shared like 11% of the time or something. And in the condition where they generated by collaboration, they shared like 80% of the time. They, they didn't even overlap. So I think the title of this paper is something like um, uh, Collaboration Facilitates Equal Sharing in Children but not chimpanzees. So we did a, a version of it in chimpanzees. Chimps don't naturally share quite, so we had to do a separate thing, but chimps don't care. They don't care whether you contributed in the collaboration or not. They're equally stingy in both cases. Uh, and so collaboration, the fact that you worked on it doesn't, doesn't matter to them. Uh, we do it, this is an important little twist on it. If children are collaborating with a partner like this, um, then they share roughly equally. If they pull in themselves and they generate the whole thing themselves and get it, and a free rider, some kid who has already said, nah, I don't want to collaborate with you. You do your thing. We have that rigged, of course. Do your thing. And now they get it and the kid comes over and says, okay, I'm ready for my share now. Even though I was over there playing on something else fun while you were doing all this work, I'm ready for my share now. The kids don't share. So you don't share with free riders because they don't deserve it. They didn't contribute. Chimps, we have several studies, they don't care whether you contributed or not. They're, not. they're not rewarding your contribution. So again, it's important in the evolution of cooperation that cooperators benefit from working together and that free riders don't benefit to the same degree. And that, that makes cooperation beneficial for individuals and then it can evolve, All right? Free riders will ruin everything. And I don't need to bring up any examples from the real world or from the, uh, the, uh, from the EU or anything else about people pulling all the weight and who, who's free riding or whatever. We all have a natural dislike of free riders. Right? That's, and that's, you can already see it here. Okay, social cultural learning. So now we're getting to the something like the ratchet effect. And I'm going to show that um, uh, young kids both uh, learn more uh, in more detail from adults. And the other thing is teaching. <coughs> so here's a little girl and uh, um, uh, 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 this is a light that turns on when you press it down. And uh, this, this little girl is, um, uh, we have a thing, you do it beginning, just give it to them naturally. They press down with their hand and it turns on. So when you press the top of the light, it turns on. But now we're gonna show her, we're gonna teach a different way to do it. Let's see what she does. All right, we're going to use the ball to turn it on. And she, her, again, her natural way to do it is with her hand. But as soon as she sees the teaching, she says, oh, that's the way to do it. And she does it with the ball and looks up to the face. Is that right? Is that the way you do it? All right. And now she's going to show her a different way. And she's ready to change just to follow the teaching because we trust adults to teach us the right way to do things. And so now she's going to use her wrist. Again, this is not the hand. This is not the normal way. And she, you can see she uses her wrist. She would use her hand normally. Okay. Chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas and orangutans, they do it however they feel like doing it at the moment. And uh, they don't really do it like you do it. And here's an experiment that will show this idea. This is an apparatus. I'm just showing a sort of an abstract representation, but these are two separate studies, one with chimps and one with kids. We didn't put, we don't call the cops. We didn't um, put kids and chimps in the same room at the same time. This is done first with chimps and, and then with um, kids. Um, and what they see is they see somebody getting a reward out of this apparatus. Sorry, the, this um, thing is too close. Um, they see somebody getting a reward out of this apparatus here. Sorry, start over. They are successful themselves from retrieving a reward out of here three times in a row. Then they watch three other individuals stick something in a hole over here and they're successful this way. So here's the one that they have been successful themselves. And this is the one where they've seen other people be successful. The chimps almost never 
follow the other guys. Once I'm successful myself, I don't care what everybody else does. Children, they see other children, they themselves are successful here. They see three other children successful here. 60% of them switch to the other one, even though they've been successful in the old one. So they are, their trigger is, is set to follow others very readily uh, and even overriding a previous, an, an already successful behavior in a way that the chimps are not. Okay, and, <clears throat> and just to really drive it home, a phenomenon that's um, sometimes called over-imitation, this, um, th this is the five-year-old girl, so this is the only five-year-old you'll see, I think. This is the oldest one, but um, um, this um, uh, adult has told this child, we're gonna, we're gonna move this rice, uh, we're gonna move some of this rice from this bin to this bin. Right, and now she's going to show, okay, all right, we're going to move the mice from this minute and then, okay, here, I'll show you how to do it. And she's going to show her how to do it. Okay, so she does this, which, you know, really doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> okay, this is how you do it. This is how, she, she showed me how to do it. This is how you do it. It's called over imitation because with these older kids that can talk like a five-year-old, you can ask them, is it necessary to do this to take the rice over? And they'll say no. They know it's not causally necessary. They're doing it because this is the way you do it. This is the way we do it. This is the way she showed me to do it. So adults are teaching, which other great apes and other primates and other species in general don't do. And kids are conforming in a way that the others don't. So um, um, uh, active teaching on the, from the adult side and active conformity on the child side. And, and that gets you the ratchet effect. That gets you this building up in complexity because everything that any individual does, everybody else does. And children themselves can even do something like teaching already at 14 months of age, or sorry, 18 months of age. This child's 18 months. Um, so um, um, we have her behind plexiglass there because we don't want her to actually go physically help. There's a puppet having trouble operating an uh, apparatus and the kid knows how to operate it. The kid's already done it. And the, and the puppet is struggling and this happens fairly quickly. So watch, uh, she's gonna show her how to do it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Here, like this, okay? Right. So she already, not only does she respond to teaching, she knows how to teach somebody something, to show them, teach the most simple form of teaching here, okay? Uh, some of them say, viso, like this. Mm -hmm. All right. So teaching and conformity are part of what gets that ratchet, uh, are, are the key to the human ratchet. Now, I, ha I have a book, as Dan uh, mentioned, on uh, the evolution, uh, sorry, uh, the natural history of human thinking. It depends on how you define thinking, but I would say that many animals think. And, were, and again, it depends on how you define it. You can define it narrowly enough so you say that they don't if it's verbal and all that. But in a general meaning, where thinking means the following. I'm looking at a problem and I'm imagining solutions in my head and I, and I land on one that I think works, and only then do I act. So it's mentally simulating the world before acting. And you'll see this in a, um, this is an orangutan, and um, the, the problem is, um, there's, a, there's a problem in the other room. You can't see the other room. There's a problem in the other room from reaching a thing, you're gonna see it, all right? And some of these tools, only one of these tools works, and the other two don't. And she's not encountered these tools before. And the, tr the, the experiment is this. She has to come from that other room into here. And in th this room here, she cannot see the problem. So she has to hold the problem in her head and choose the right tool. And again, it happens very quickly, so you have to pay attention. But she's gonna tick, 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 oh, this one. Because if it's too loose, it won't work. If it's like a rope, it won't work. Uh, this one doesn't have different lengths, but there's variations on this task where they have different lengths. And you're gonna see the orangutan come in and, and sorry, those are the, the Sheba going up and down. And you're gonna see her very quickly, try each of them. Boom, 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 that one. Now into the other room, there's her little baby there. And just 
in case you think I'm exaggerating some, you're going to see she doesn't share with this child at all. Okay, so I would call this thinking. I would call what she was doing, going through those three tools as imagining the problem and sticking on a solution and then uh, going in. Now, I don't have a beautiful video for you, but um, we have a lot of studies and there are others by other people about children, essentially, basically from about three or four years old, you can present them with a problem that neither one of them can solve on their own, but together they can solve it. And as you get into school age, that's more and more. Um, they have a, a classic Piagetian conservation problem. One of them, both of them can't solve it by themselves. You get together and let them talk. Well, what about this? What about that? And they think one of them saying, um, oh, the water in this one looks taller. Oh, yes, but this one's skinnier. And so they have a discussion from different perspectives and they come to a solution that neither could come to alone. I know of no studies with any non-human animals where individuals can do things together that they can't do alone. So we really put our heads together to solve problems. And anybody who works in any kind of, uh, in, uh, in most human endeavors, we know that cooperation is crucial. I'm a scientist, I can't do anything by myself. I have to have a team. Uh, I have to have uh, working together. Um, you know, um, it's, and, and most of business and uh, other endeavors were working together. And even in, in, in things that are more uh, solitary, you typically have a background, a, a cultural um, context in which uh, things are happening. Okay, finally uh, is uh, social norms. Now, social norms are things like, um, uh, uh, I, I assume in Denmark, as in Germany and many European countries, when you come in the house, you take off your shoes and leave them by the door, yes? No, you don't. In Germany, you do, <laughs> okay? And, uh, uh, okay, so this is a, I wasn't used to this uh, conventional norm until I got to Germany. Uh, and so um, uh, these are things that we all sort of know. We all in the culture know. And you kind of frown on people if they're in your culture and they know about the norm if they don't do it. And one of the things we discovered quite early is that um, children not only follow social norms where they fit in, that you want to follow norms to fit in with the group, to be like everybody else, to not get punished for breaking rules and whatever. But what we noticed was a phenomenon where when others break the rules, the children intervene and say, uh, uh, uh. all right, uh, now I'm gonna show you two things. One of them is, this is not that, this is similar to that, but um, this is a precursor for that. So the thing about social norms, one of the prerequisites for social norms working is that I care about being evaluated by you. So if I'm here, um, you know, I chose not to come give my lecture tonight in gym shorts and a t-shirt, okay? I thought that would not be following the social norms of giving a lecture at a, in a, in a, a, a prestigious uh, forum such as this. So I was thinking about your evaluation of me uh, when I chose my clothes, okay? And we do that all day, every day. We're thinking about how other people are evaluating us. Half of the psychiatric problems in the world today are over worrying about what other people are thinking about you. Um, so this is a little study where, um, uh, this is done with kids and chimps, but this is the kid version here, where this little girl uh, is told there's another kid coming, and this is her stickers, and these are your stickers, and this little girl, it turns out, she's missing the big one in the middle that she needs. So she's supposed to fill out her paper with stickers, and she's missing the big one. And this kid that's not even here yet has extra big ones, look, all right? And so she could take it. And what the manipulation in this study is, is for half the kids, they were doing it like this, with a peer watching. This is not the little girl coming here, this is just another kid watching. And in the other, and in the other condition, um, she's alone by herself. And so I'm just gonna show you the one where the other kid is watching. So she has the opportunity to steal. You know, the other one has more than she needs. It's not really that much stealing, but okay, you get the idea. She sees the other girl has those other extra stickers, but she doesn't take it. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we all, so the, 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 the unsurprising finding is that we also did a, a version where she could uh, gen donate some to the other kid generously. So now the roles are reversed and she has more than she needs and she could give the other girl one that she needs. And 
uh, the, the general finding is that the kids are uh, share more and steal less if they're being watched. That's why I say, totally unsurprising. Right. Chimpanzees did this and they don't care. So they're probably psychiatrically much more healthy. Right? They don't care what other people are thinking about them. So they steal and share the same, no matter who's watching. Okay? So, uh, so social norms, a prerequisite is that we care about other people's evaluations. And now from the other side, this is the side about the one conforming to the norms. And now we have the kid watching while a puppet breaks the norm. Now this is, we just teach them a little game and this is how you play the game. The rules to the game don't matter. You just wanna see the kid's behavior. Um, this has actually got a fair amount of complexity to it, but uh, this experimenter is supposed to stay out of it, but the kid keeps trying to bring her in uh, by uh, tattling to her. Um, uh, I've I found that uh, um, non-native English speakers never know the word tattle. Uh, the German word is petzen. I don't know what, is there a Danish for tattling? Uh, where you, you go to the adult and say, she stole my thing. Uh, okay, thank you. All right, so, uh, so he's tattling together and whatnot. So, um, uh, so uh, here, the, the, the puppet is gonna break the rules and you'll see what she does. If you understand a little German, it's even funnier. But there, there are... Three years old, three years old. So she's ignoring him on purpose. Darf ich jetzt noch mal dachsen? Ja. Darf ich dachsen? So now it's another puppet. Geschummelt. Ist die gut dran, ne? Ich schreibe noch schnell was auf und ihr macht dabei weiter. Weißt du, der Elefant hat geschummelt. Now, I have been asked the question, these are German children, right? Okay. <laughs> they tend to be rule following in conformity and all that. I, I, I say that in front of all my German friends and they all laugh. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not speaking badly about them. Uh, but I will say we have a recent study uh, just came out this year that I don't need to show you, but we did it across seven different cultures where some of them are uh, close to hunter-gatherer cultures in Africa and South America, in non-literate um, societies, uh, small-scale societies that get most of their food hunting and gathering. And we taught the kids a little way to play something. And then the kid watched and the way she learned the rules, the other kid was playing it a different way. And in all the cultures, they jump up and say, no, no. And quite often they do it with, moral, with moralized language, with normative language. Like, no, you, can't, you shouldn't do it like that. You must do this, you have to do that. So this normative language is very important. They're saying, you must do this, you have to do that, because that means it's not just my opinion that I don't like it, it means it's something much bigger than that. Right, so these three-year-olds, are in, uh, across, the, across cultures are, are, um, uh, are uh, enforcing social norms on others. Now, let me sort of end with, um, uh, 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 I think, a really neat finding that people find interesting. I, I found it interesting myself. This, uh, this study was picked up more than a lot of other ones of, of ours by the newspapers because they found it so uh, sort of... Um, I don't know, uh, cute maybe. So there are close to 200 species of non-human primates and all 200 of them have eyes like this where if they're looking straight ahead, you can't see the white sclera. They have white sclera on their eyes and you can see it if they look to the side, but if they're looking straight ahead, you can't see it. There's only one species of primate that has eyes like this and that's this little boy here and um, and these eyes are not only all cultures, all individuals. My evolutionary geneticist colleagues in Leipzig were saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to explain to you that we think this is cooperative eyes. They say, oh, let's find out when these emerged. So um, in evolution, we can find out when this sort of cooperative thing happened. But the geneticists need somebody with a syndrome, some genetic anomaly where, anomaly where you don't have any white eyes. 
And there are almost no people like that anywhere. They can't find anybody who doesn't have whites of the eyes. This means it's been very important in human evolution. So anybody who didn't have whites of the eyes died out. And so this is a very, a, a very important trait. And what we did was the following. Um, uh, so, or, or let me explain the cooperative eye idea first, then I'll tell you what we did. The cooperative eye idea is this, that um, if you and I are competing over food or we're competing over something, I just assume you not see where I'm looking, okay? I'm trying to get it and I don't want you to know what I'm doing before I'm doing it, so I don't want you to see where I'm looking. But if we're cooperating, we're doing something together, uh, we're working, you know, we're like some of these little tasks the kids were doing where they're playing games or they're lifting something together. I want you to see where I'm looking because it helps us coordinate. It helps us cooperate. Right? So the idea is that uh, and I can't, my whites of my eyes evolves not for some advantage to you that it's advantageous for you to follow my gaze, my direction, but that it's an advantage to me that you follow my gaze direction. So we think this only emerged in a cooperative culture where, uh, or a cooperative society where um, it would be to my advantage if you follow my gaze. Whereas if we're competitive like chimps, it wouldn't be to my advantage. So this is the idea. And what the experiment is, is do children use these whites of the eyes to follow uh, gaze direction um, and do chimps? And here's, how we, here's what we did. It, uh, we, um, um, uh, we, we, they were looking at us and chimpanzees do follow your gaze direction. So if you, if you close your eyes and look up, chimpanzees look up. If you just move your eyes up like this, they don't. So they're following your head. They're not following your eyes. They're following your head. Children, it's just the opposite. You close your eyes and look up and they, look at your, they just look at you, all right? And you do your eyes up and they look up. So children are using this, um, uh, the eyes to follow gaze direction where chimpanzees just use a general head direction. So, um, so again, we think this is because um, this is useful in cooperative activities, whereas in competitive activities, it's not only not useful, it's probably uh, disadvantageous. Right? So um, this is a, a morphological marker, a physical uh, trait that might possibly go along with um, cooperation, the evolution of cooperation. So to conclude, let me just say that um, my sort of most general uh, conclusion uh, on a very grand scale, I guess, is human children are adapted for cooperation and culture in ways that other great apes are not, and that these adaptations are fundamental to uniquely human processes of cognition, communication, cooperation, and morality. And I, I will just say in, in anticipation of, and, and I, I don't mean to forestall it, I welcome the question, but about if humans are so cooperative, why is the world such a mess? Um, uh, is, is, is to say that um, um, uh, we, are, we are cooperation. Uh, if you think humans are not cooperative, you just have the wrong comparison. <laughs> you need to compare to other animals <laughs> and compare to chimpanzees. And then you will see that humans are cooperative. But we have a lot of cases where we're not cooperative and I welcome the chance to uh, discuss that. Thank you very much.